Hey, everybody. It is 12 p.m. in the East. It is 9 a.m. in the West. It is Monday, October 24th, 2022. And that means it is Lunch with Lincoln. I'm your host for today, Reed Galen. Very happy to have along once again, Pete Strzok. Pete is a former special agent in the FBI. His specialty is national security. Um, so, Pete, I want to thank you for joining me again today. Yeah, Reed, it's great to be here. Thanks. So lots, lots going on. Obviously, we're 15 days from Election Day. Um, I want to start with this idea of, um, especially in Arizona, that there are these people who are sitting outside voter drop boxes. Um, you know, their intent is to intimidate. Some are armed. Arizona, in particular, Maricopa County, appears to be getting the most attention for this. Um, you know, there. You know, the the I, I believe. There's a delicious reason they're there. Um, you know, they're Republicans or conservative stalwarts will say, oh, no, they have their right to be in this place. Um, you know, the sheriff of Maricopa County has seemed to have taken little to no action on this. But give me a sense from your perspective as someone who worked at a federal level, understanding the threats to uh, the United States internally. What what does this foreshadow for you? Reed, I think it, it is Absolutely, what you described. I mean, in pure and simple, it's voter intimidation. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind that these folks, particularly in the way they're dressed, I mean, I'm sure, you know, they're with, you know, body armor and, you know, f magazines for automatic weapons, you know, masks, probably the one and only time you won't get them to wear a mask is when they're sitting with right. a stake out of a drop box. You know, it's clear they're not there. If somebody shows up with a cowboy hat and boots, drop off something, they have no interest in that. But if you're a person of color or anybody that, you know, it, it draws, concerned that they might be voting for the other side. Well, that's absolutely something that they're watching. And there's no question in my mind that, you know, when they show up and I saw some reporting that sheriffs have gone out to measure to make sure they're a sufficient distance away. Well, I, you know, come on, if they're visible and they're an armed or, you know, certainly, you know, tricked out in, in body armor and tactical gear that has an intimidating effect. And the worry is that there is also reporting these aren't you know, one-off events, that there are coordinating bodies behind this that are trying, you know, getting people to, hey, come to this website, come to this organization, sign up, and to do this sort of Dropbox monitoring in a coordinated way, and certainly coordinated in a way to intimidate one side of the electorate. And that, from a federal perspective, you know, I had no appreciation until we started looking at what Russia in particular was doing in the 2016 elections the vastness of the U.S. electoral system. I mean, the states, the federal government has a very limited role in the way states right. administer their votes by design, right? This is something that, you know, the federal government doesn't dictate a lot of how those things are done. The states- well, goes do back all the, the way state. to the Constitution. Right, I, that's baked into the system. And so from a federal perspective, to try and look at threats to infrastructure is it starts being a very not perilous but there are real limitations by design as you said from the constitution to prevent the federal government from getting involved in a two in a heavy-handed way or an inappropriate way in the local votes so as a result that's left to localities which are huge you know every county has different potentially means and mechanisms by which they are doing early voting, whether or not they're using drop boxes, the systems, whether electronic or paper or mail-in or early voting, all of those are different. And so as a result, you rely on the local law enforcement to enforce that. And in many cases, this is done by sheriffs who are elected officials. These are not, you know, state police departments. We have sort of a, a meritocracy. These are run by sheriffs who are elected in, I think, every state but Connecticut and Alaska, maybe. But it, again, it's the potential for abuse is high. The ability of the federal government to impact that and is limited, I mean, unless there's a clear violation of federal law, but there is this, you know, wiggle room for mischief. And we're seeing that play out um, first and foremost in Maricopa County, but I, I would not be surprised to see, particularly leading up to election day and on election day itself, a lot of mischief, you know, for two purposes. One is to cast doubt and question on the upcoming sure. midterms, but a lot of this is going to be sort of dry runs for the next presidential election to see what works, to see what doesn't, to see where the, you know, how far lines can be pushed or not, or find new ideas. So I, I'm, I'm worried from a federal perspective. Uh, I don't know, you know, one last thought is the, the, the government is so, DOJ just sent in a request to Congress a few weeks ago for additional attorneys for the January 6th prosecution saying we can't keep up. 
you know, we're overwhelmed, yeah. we need more attorneys. And we're running into problems of either statutes of limitation, tolling for uncharged people, or speedy trial act issues for those who have already been tried. When we right. look at that system and you say, okay, that system is maxed out right now. The system is maxed out with stuff that occurred a year and a half ago. What happens right. if we have a burst of crime in two weeks? This already overtaxed system on the verge of not being able to function if you have a vast influx of new crime and new investigations, I, I don't, I hope people in, I, I would hope and expect that people within DOJ and the FBI are thinking about that and aware of it. What I'm concerned about is that I don't see a lot of outward messaging about that. You know, it went to Congress and what I saw two weeks ago, are people on the Hill are talking to various folks on the Appropriations Committee saying, oh, I wasn't aware of this. I'm not sure. I didn't know this was an issue. Well, that whoever's job it is to make that an issue should be doing a more vocal job of it because I think we're looking at a taxed justice system that I worry that if we have a significant amount of federal crime or bad acts in two, three weeks, that the system is not prepared to handle a massive influx of new illegal activity and investigations of that. All right. And one note on, on sheriffs, just to go back, m most sheriff's positions that, you know, they're notable exceptions those positions are shrine, enshrined typically in state constitutions too. And, and really, Pete, the only two people that that sheriffs answer to are God himself and voters, right? And and he's they, they are almost all untouchable from a legal perspective. Uh, the more political heat they get, oftentimes it feels like they just sort of, you know, reinforce their, I don't answer to anybody, all right? I literally don't answer to anybody. And I think that's that's one concern too, is that, you know, um, you know, whether it's the sheriff of Maricopa County, right? He's, he's thinking, okay, can I send deputies out there to tell these guys to scram? I could. And my guess is they could find any reason they wanted to, right? They're just not doing it. Um, I also think, and we said this to somebody last week, is that every attorney general um, who is willing, every attorney general should, but every attorney general we believe is willing, as well as every secretary of state is willing, should send some document to sheriffs and local police departments that says here is what people are and aren't allowed to do as a reminder around polling places just to put them on the record that like you can't say i didn't know what i was supposed to do right and also that you know it shows that if it's an attorney general or a secretary of state like we take this stuff seriously as you said you know pete it's not just that you know there's a county registrar in a lot of these places uh the folks they bring in for election day are temporary workers my guess is probably a lot less, not even not a lot less, but probably a, a, a noticeable fewer number of people who are willing to do this stuff after they watch uh, people like uh, Shay and her mom, Miss Ruby, for the January 6th committee, right? Do you, do you really want this kind of trouble? Now, I will say this is that um, I had um, the Fair Voting Center folks on the podcast last week, and they said they, I think they've recruited something like 150,000 poll workers mm -hmm. across the country. Uh, obviously, always need more. Uh, go to powerofthepolls.org, gang, if you're out there and interested. Um, but Pete, let's let's talk about this because in the context of 2024, if you go back two years to your, you know, I want to bring your your idea about DOJ and prosecutions together, which is many of the people who consider these ideas, who try to put these ideas into place in 2020, have really faced no sanction whatsoever. It's been the it's been the rank and file people who stormed the gates at the Capitol. Um, maybe a Steve Bannon who's in contempt. But, you know, from Donald Trump on down, Cleta Mitchell, John Eastman, you know, any number of the members of Congress, like they, none, Mark Meadows, like none of these people are under, I mean, maybe they're under investigation, or as I understand it, under indictment. So it says, you know, it's like the, 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 the failed coup that goes unpunished is just a warm up act, as you noted. And so you, you, you take all of that stuff, you mix it into this noxious blend, and you look, forward two weeks, then look forward two weeks and two years and say, okay, now we know what they're going to do. We heard, uh, 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 what's his name? Bannon saying he's got, he's recruited 11,000 people to go out and challenge every ballot. Um, you telling me that they're going to go, they're going to go to York County, Pennsylvania, or they're going to go to center city, Philadelphia, right? They're going to go to, uh, to, uh, Traverse city, Michigan, or they're going to go to downtown Detroit. Like we know where they're going to cause trouble. These are not secrets. Trump even said, like, he wants to make sure that the votes are, you know, quote unquote, you know, disqualified in Philadelphia this year because he still thinks uh, that, you know, the, the votes were stolen from him in 2020, which, of course, we all know is a fallacy, as does he. Right. But now he's decided this is the only game he's going to play. And again, he hasn't really suffered for it yet. 
Yeah, I think that's right. And what's concerning is, I mean, I think back to the, uh, you know, the 2020 vote and a lot of the reporting that people when Trump was thinking about challenging it, advisors and attorneys telling him, look, you can't, if you want to pick a state, if you want to, you know, go back and think about Florida. And if, you know, you want to challenge that in one state, you can get a credible legal team together and you can mount a challenge, whether or not it has merit, you can do it. But if you want to do this broad five plus state effort to challenge it, it's not going to be possible in the amount of time. It's going to be too diffuse. It's going to come off looking, you know, at both in appearance and in law to be rather shoddy. And so as a result, you got what we got. I mean, you have these, you know, kind of, you know, a, a bunch of, you know, crazy, incompetent, conspiracy laden attorneys who, you know, one lost all but one, you know, whatever it was, 60 plus lawsuits that uh, Trump lost. Right. But the issue is when you look at judicial accountability, they're all still, you know, many of them are defending right now January 6th defendants. These are the attorneys. And when you look at the ability of state bars who the the sort of ethics monitors of attorney activity, even Cindy Powell, I mean, I saw she was, you know, complaining about all these complaints that she has had. I think it's still her bar membership and she's undergoing, you know, proceedings in the state of Texas. Right, Texas. But, right. but other than Rudy, you know, yeah, you know, several of the attorneys who were involved in the Michigan lawsuit were sanctioned by the judge, but they have yet to have, by all accounts, you know, sort of revocation of their ability to practice law. So all this quack law that was brought to bear on these frivolous lawsuits in 2020 that were clear that you have judges saying this was an abuse of the judicial system. And yet the inability of the legal profession as a whole to sort of step forward and say, we have ethical rules and regulations and we are going to enforce them in the context of, you know, yes, everybody's entitled to a vigorous legal defense. Everybody's entitled to vigorous legal, legal advocacy for whatever your issue is. But when that crosses the line, when you have judges sanctioning people in the context of legal action, which is a direct challenge to our democracy, this is something that we're not going to stand for. I, 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 I think the many elements of the bar have fallen short in terms of effective um, sanctioning of those individuals that would provide a deterrence to prevent the exact same thing, which I guarantee you, I'm certain we are going to see in two weeks across the board. And, you know, pick a state. We're going to see in Pennsylvania. We're going to see in Wisconsin. We're going to see in Michigan. We're going to see in Arizona. Right. And there is, th th there is no, as a profession, it is time for the legal community to step up and say, again, this isn't this many of these things. This isn't a gray area. When we run into things where there are clearly inaccurate state statements, false statements, you know, f figures and facts that are not, in fact, accurate being used in pleadings repeatedly. That is the kind of thing that we're not going to stand by and just say, oh, you know, well, we'll we'll investigate for two years and it'll quietly go away. But but Pete, let, let me expand our conversation and let me step outside just the, the bounds of the politics going to hear because. You bring up something that's really interesting, the legal profession, the bar associations in each of these individual states. Um, and it seems like they, like the media, um, I'll say the national media, um, the D.C. sort of political set, you know, whether that's Congress, one end of Pennsylvania Avenue or the other, the lobbying profession, all of this stuff is like all of these paradigms are broken, right? Like the legal professions never had to deal with seditionists, maybe since the Civil War, right? Um, I assume it was a different deal then. Um, but like, it, it seems like everybody's still unwilling. I don't want to say they're unable because they're able. They're just unwilling to confront the what's before us, the perils before us. Uh, it's it's like you know, oh well, you know, we have to tell both sides of a story, but one side is lying. Yeah, but it's both sides. Well, that, that's that's like not the basis of what you're supposed to do, right? I, I, I've told this story before. There's a guy uh, I interviewed. He wrote a book on the Proud Boys. And he said anytime he, he interviewed Enrico Terrio, he would write, I'm going to provide a quote from Enrico Terrio. He lies for a living. Here is the quote. That is a lie. <laughs> right? Like, and most, I would assume most outlet, you know, and he writes for HuffPost. And I, my guess is most mainstream outlets wouldn't do that. But the point about, you know, it, looking, I guess, from your perspective as someone where the FBI, right, was a stalwart of of law and order, but also an internal, you know, there are national police force. I, I may, I don't want to underestimate it, right? Federal police force, whatever, federal investigator. I mean, the Federal Bureau of Investigation. But do you see that from your perspective, too, is that there's been so much change so quickly that everybody's whipped around and everybody's just sort of hiding under first principles? 
Uh, yeah, I do. And I think the problem is I think Trump broke every aspect of sort of the dynamic of our political, and I don't mean, you know, Democrat, Republican political, but the, right. the sort of political life of our nation. And whether that is the courts and attorneys, which you were just talking about, I certainly think it expands to you. You're talking about the press and what is, you know, what is the role of the the media in the traditional paradigm of how they research and present the facts just as here's what somebody said, but needing to step back and say in the context of, you know, this is what was said, but they're lying, or this is not a function of, on the one hand, you know, balance here as opposed to balance there, that this is covering something that is increasingly clearly apparent to be a fundamental threat to our democratic order, to the federal government, and how all these institutions were broken in the same way. I mean, I, you know, I think we may have talked about the, the, the first, last time I came on the show, mm -hmm. governmental organizations, like everything else, evolve over time. I mean, the, the U.S. government exists, you know, over whatever we're at now, 200 plus 50, 40 years or whatever it is, in the context of how that these executive branch agencies are going to work with regard to Congress, with regard to the courts, with regard to the American people, with regard to the president. And there is a generally accepted norms of behavior in all of those interactions that you get to Trump and he totally breaks it. And so you see organizations doing what organizations do. And that is one, first and foremost, protect themselves. And what that means is getting out of the line of fire, right? You're in, if, if the wrath of the, you know, the toddler president is suddenly focused your way. There's a twofold obligation that you're feeling. One, the first thing is I personally, whoever I am, don't want to be under attack. And to my organization that I'm leading, I don't want them under attack. So you see. Well, that... we've both been there, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> right. And then in this context, it's 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 not just. And here you know, we are. <laughs> president, you know, Obama or Clinton or Bush is angry at somebody and there's some infighting going on. This is like individual targeting saying you're a loser, you're, you're corrupt, you know, you committed treason. I mean, it's very individualized. It's very personal. And organizations, this toolkit that they have developed to exist in this bureaucratic environment doesn't work anymore. And the response is, you know, you see somebody, you know, you've got a, uh, you know, your, your, your house is on fire and you show up with a plumber's toolkit and you can't, mm -hmm. the things that you would do to fix a plumbing problem don't apply to this fire that's going on. And so you see this mismatch between the, this sort of unprecedented attacks by Trump and a response to like, well, we're going to respond to him like we responded to everybody else who played by the rules. And I think some of the frustration and the concern is at what point it is important to return to norms that have been developed. But where do you start making exceptions for this truly unprecedented activity by the former president? And particularly in the context of him continuing to be the motive force behind the Republican Party. And I just I worry that there is that there is too much of a instinct to return to institutional norms that are not appropriate to address the truly once in a lifetime threat that Trump poses. But but I think it's more than that a cup for a couple of things. One, and I want to talk about uh, Bannon and, and, and the federal workforce, too, because all, all this ties together is that it, the system, the federal system, right, the governmental system that we've had basically shaped post-World War II National Security Act in 1947, right? Uh, and then an outgrowth of the different things that a country that was arguably prior to World War II, many Americans still lived in the 19th century, right? Now suddenly the whole country in the span of five, six, seven years is now in the 20th century, right? And so we're catching up in national highways, you know, you know, people are buying houses, GI Bill, all this stuff that created the America that, you know, so many MAGA folks want to go back to, which was imperfect at best in its own time. Um, but, you know, sort of held up as the paragon of America as the hegemon for, what, 15, 20 years. Um, that time is over, right? And we're in this transition phase, transitionary phase, transitory phase, I don't know what the right word is, where whatever happens after we beat Trump and that and Trumpism will have to necessarily be different. Because we've seen, okay, there are things that the those guardrails are broken. Now, are we going to replace them, Pete, with the guardrails we built in 1953, right? Or are we going to replace them with guardrails that matter today? 
are we going to get back to norms that worked in 1960? Or are we going to create nor you know, are we going to create norms that that make sense for today? And I think that's from one of my frustrations is this, you know, in going back to 2015 with Trump is just this lack of imagination or lack of willingness to believe that the world that we have all most of us have come up in is fundamentally gone. And in this period of turbulence is going to be the deciding factor if we go, if we go one direction to the ability to create the 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 system, the country that we want going forward, or is Trump going to win? Are these people going to win and forget about it, right? The, eventually the lights will go out, the water won't come on, and they won't care, right? Because they'll be fine. Um, and to your point before we started talking that, you know, uh, I did a couple, I've done a couple of interviews with uh, big time publications in the last two weeks. And Pete, they're already like, what would a second Trump term look like? There are, that's where they are now, right? Like they're, they're like, they've blown past the midterms. They've blown past anybody, even the concept of Trump not running any competition to him. And I said, like, here's what it's gonna look like. he's going to be in acting, right? You, you think the people you had and, you know, you think you, the people he had around him b- before were bad. Wait till you see these goons. Right. Um, you know, to your point about, uh, you know, the 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 destruction of the civil service. Right. They'll get rid of everybody they don't like every schedule C, quote unquote, employee. And that's like, guys, that's the lowest level, like presidential appointment. That's what I got after I worked for George W. Bush in 2000. Right. I got shipped to the Pentagon then I got shipped to HHS then I got shipped to Treasury, you know, all over the place. You, you're you know, it's the last it's the last vestige of the spoil system, Pete. Right. But they're going to put those people in there who are like gremlins, right? They're going to go out and they're going to tear out every last circuit they can. Because again, to them, it's either we hate the system we have or like Bannon, it's I'm a Leninist. Let's burn every goddamn thing down. Right. And I think they've been clear about it. And I mean, Trump is talking about it during, you know, campaign speeches within the past, you know, the past two or three that he's conducted, you know, whenever it is the past two, three months. But it two, two aspects of that. One is, I think that there is a clear indication it's they have every intention of moving well beyond Schedule C, which you are. It's like looking, I've seen things saying anybody in the senior executive service, you know, career professionals who have moved up into the executive level to have some ability to reach into these organizations and not, you know, the scary, terrifying part is not political appointees. And they tried to do this at the very end of the last administration and it kind of got put into place or was being talked about in December, January of 20 going into 21 about reaching into organizations to the career professionals and being able at a certain level to say, well, we want to move these people out. We want to have the ability to not fire them, but remove them from their position because these are policy level you know, jobs. And the argument is if you describe policy level broadly enough, you know, if you take any organization, and I mean, I know the FBI and the intelligence community, but if you have every, you know, you have the FBI, you have the director, the deputy, the director is the only political appointee in the FBI. Right. The deputy director, the executive assistant directors, the assistant directors, deputy assistant directors, section chiefs, and then you get, you know, two levels and then you're at agents. But all of those people are career FBI agents or analysts or professional staff. If Trump and Bannon have their way to be able to come in and reach that far down in the organization and just change people and put in, you know, the Tony Ornatos, the loyalists who they know support them and put them in the positions across not just the FBI, but everywhere in DHS, everywhere in CIA, everywhere in NSA, you name it. That is an extraordinary challenge to the professional objective civil services we know it. And the amount of corruption that would follow, I can't even begin to fathom. And they are clearly stating to have the intention to, you know, root out the deep state and do exactly this. And I know like Jerry Connolly, Congressman Connolly, I think is is trying, is working on some legislation to sort of shore up civil service protections, but it doesn't seem, I don't know how much of a legislative priority it is with what do we have here? A month and a half left, two months maybe before, um, you know, potentially one or both houses or the chambers flip. I the, the prospect of if there is going to be legal reform to shore up these guardrails, I don't see it happening. Maybe hopefully I'm wrong, but I think it's a real threat. And then the second component in the context of all that, at the end of the last administration, I think, you know, you think back to that crazy, you know, December time frame, and there's that December, I think December 18th meeting in the Oval Office in the middle of the night where you had Mike Flynn and Sidney Powell and Patrick Byrne on the one hand and right. Cipollone and you know everybody yelling at each other where they're encouraging Trump on the one hand to like invoke martial law or you use the National Guard to seize voting machines. At the end of the last administration, I think it was very clear to Trump and those people around him, a lot of the things they wanted to do 
they couldn't because you had independent leadership within the Department of Defense. You had independent leadership within the federal law enforcement community, whether that was at the FBI or DHS or wherever it may be. And they had insufficient control to be able to do the sort of things. You know, what was that? It came out during the January 6th hearings where I think it was, I forget who it was telling uh, Jeffrey Clark, you know, if you walked into to, you know, Chris Ray's office, he wouldn't even know who the fuck you are. And right. you know, probably not. But the point being, at least on Trump's side, they understood if you were going, if you truly want to have this absolute authoritarian control, you sure as heck better have control over you, you, the coercive power of the state, right? Everybody, right? The power ministries, on, as they're called, right? right? You, 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 those are, and you, and you look, and again, you know, going back to you know, growing up in the developing world, that that was the first thing. Every time there was a coup or an attempted coup, you know, you install loyalists and in the head of the the police forces, the domestic security services, the military. Those are the first things that you put your people in charge of, because at the end of the day, that is what is going to, when push comes to shove, that is what controls the population. And I think and expect, and I'm terrified that a next Trump administration is going to be well aware of that fact. And you're going to see, as you said, actings put into place at these organizations um, that would pose a real threat to what we, you know, traditionally see as the, you know, a well-functioning democracy. Um, you know, this all, this all ties together, right? It's, it's, there's not one thing, it's many things that come together. Um, are you surprised at how many Republican voters now just accept the big lie out of hand that Trump won 2020? Or is it more of the Goebbels, tell the biggest lie you can find, tell it over and over again, over again and eventually people will believe it? Or is it a combination of, you know, several things? Because I, I, this stuff doesn't occur in a vacuum, right? Like it's not, they're not the only people talking. Right. I'm, so, I'm, I'm not surprised at a ground level that you have people believing what they do because it's what they're hearing. It's what they're hearing from Republican leadership. It's what they're hearing from Republican aligned uh, media, you know, in particular Fox, but all the, you know, the crazies of OAN and everybody, Newsmax and the rest. So I'm not surprised that at, you know, you pick a red state voter and you ask them about whether or not there was a, you know, the, the big lies is in fact true and whether or not there's going to be a free and fair election coming up. And for, I, I'm not surprised to hear them say and adhere to, you know, this, this craziness it's being put out. I am surprised. I thought there would be a bigger capability within the leadership, not only of the Republican Party, but the funding behind it, the real power behind the, you know, the visible Republican mm -hmm. Party. After Trump lost, to come in and say, not only was that horribly destructive, but Trump hurt our ability, you know, arguably he, Trump, <laughs> telling, don't worry about Georgia, Gat, Warnock, and, uh, 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 you know, the, uh, shoot, I'm forgetting it, the, the second. Ossoff. Yeah, yeah, right. Ossoff elected. And so that it not only was Trump himself is destructive, but Trump's advocacy for certain candidates and perspectives is causing us to lose elections at the federal level, at the state level. And so not only is this a sort of toxic to our democracy, but it's also toxic to our party. And I don't know what that magic moment and failure was that that sort of transition and decision never occurred. I think on the one hand, you know, people said, well, I don't want to, you know, upset my constituents. There's enough bad acts here by Trump that, you know, Joe Biden's DOJ will take care of him. That they, you know, between, you know, the FBI, DOJ, the state of New York, the state of Georgia, let the criminal process run. Trump will hang himself and we won't have to take care of it. And lo and behold, you know, again, we're two weeks out and nothing has been taken care of. So I, I, I'm surprised. And, and if you look at McCarthy, right, McCarthy goes from telling, you know, well-heeled donors at, you know, $100,000 a person lunch earlier this year, look, I just need 20 quote unquote normal Republicans so I can be speaker and we can get this stuff done. Now, Pete, it's, yeah, probably going to impeach some people, um, not going to, you know, not going to fund Ukraine. It's going to be all Hunter Biden all the time because now he's just driven. I mean, I would blame McCarthy, right? He went down to Mar-a-Lago after January 6th, took that picture with him. And gave him, you know, gave Trump again legitimacy, not only with rank and file Republican voters, but that donor class that you're talking about. Um, and I'm shocked by it, too, because these guys know better. And here's the other part, too, is, you know, if if a, in a second Trump term, we slide further and further into oligarchy. Right. Like these guys shouldn't consider themselves safe either. Like we know how this we, we've seen this play before. We know how it goes. You're only safe until you're not. Um, but I guess some of the Titans just don't buy that. 
Right. And then that's the question is, is that what are the motivations? Because, you know, whatever, Kevin McCarthy is a horrible, miserable person. But at the end of the day, he is, in many cases, you know, a figurehead. He represents these interests that are behind this movement. And to a large right. extent, on the one hand, you have at the ground level, the, you know, people who feel their power slipping away, who feel disaffected, who feel that they are, you know, not being heard and that Trump is the person who hears them and gets them and resonates with them. But that, you know, and so they're voting that way. But at the other end of the spectrum, all the people who are funding these efforts, all the people who are, you know, advancing and coordinating the broad, you know, campaigning and the funding for the campaigning are those people who would become the oligarch class, right? I mean, these are the right. folks that stand to benefit from that. You know, they're not the second Trump administration, the, the poor, you know, voter in mid America who is struggling to make ends meet is not suddenly going to have an economic bonanza where their quality of life, you know, spectacularly improves and they have, you know, miraculously affordable health care. They, they are not the ones who are going to benefit from an economic basis from a second Trump administration. The ones who are going to benefit are the same ones who did the first time around. And this is, you know, the, the money to elite that, you know, increasingly are, you know, sort of fusing that money with control over our governance in a way that is different and starting and feels very different from just strong support for a candidate or a party and starts moving into actual much control. more control. Right. Yeah, I know. And it's funny. I mean, I, I'm going to say funny because I don't know the right word. How many of them are like Bond villains come to life, right? It's really, it's, I mean, it's, yeah, the, the people, you know, um, they're, they're all to a person, like they could all, you know, they could all be the bad guy in some crazy movie. All right, Pete, I want to thank you for coming. Remind our viewers the name of your book and, and where they can find it. Yeah, absolutely. So the book is uh, called Compromised, Counterintelligence and the Threat of Donald J. Trump. I hoped at this point it would be sort of a retrospective piece, but it does a very good job of kind of- Probably a blueprint. In my, in my humble opinion, right? Of sort of laying out on the one hand, what is counterintelligence? If you hear that word, what does it mean? But then also looking at Trump and saying and talking about why he was such a national security threat. And of course, the concern is now continues to be a national security threat. So new revised version is out in paperback. You can get it at your favorite online retailer, you know, increasingly uh, rare uh, brick and mortar bookstore or, you know, online and uh, Kindle and, and stuff like that. But uh, thanks for having me on. No, thanks, Pete. Thanks for joining. As always, gang, remember, we are 15 days to Election Day. If you want to help out, join the union.us. Follow us along for the next two weeks. The breakdown Tuesday and Thursday night. We're speaking Wednesday night. Always tune in. If you have not checked out the Lincoln Project podcast hosted by yours truly, I hope you will. Pete, thanks again. And everybody else, we'll see you next time. Thanks, Reed. Ron DeSantis, proudly restricted voter rights in Florida. His elections police force arrests people he doesn't want to vote. 20 Floridians, mostly African American, were arrested for just registering to vote, even after officials said they could. Instead of clearing their names, DeSantis held a press conference. It's not just going to be 20 arrests. This is the opening salvo. But when Hurricane Ian hit, both Republican and Democratic counties were hit. But DeSantis is only allowing three large and strongly Republican counties to skip the new rules. DeSantis uses fear and intimidation against voters he doesn't like and favoritism for those he does. That's not democracy. That's not voter integrity. Florida knows what to call it. Tyranny. This was my idea. The Lincoln Project is responsible for the content of this advertising.